today uh, we'll be discussing about the prescribing proton pump inhibitors so we'll discuss on, on these subheadings so let's begin with the definition of the deprescribing. So it's a clinically supervised process of stopping or reducing the dose of medication uh, when they cause harm or no longer provide benefit to a patient. So PPIs are one of the most commonly used medication in the world. About 7 to 15% of the patients use this medication at any time in their life and the prevalence increases to 40% for the patients who are 70 years or older. And about 11 to 84 percent of the patients uh, were found to be overprescribed uh, or uh, found to be using PPI improperly. So approximately one quarter of all the patients who receive PPI will usually continue to use them for at least one year. So basically, PPIs were developed for the treatment and prevention of the acid mediated upper GI conditions, but they are nowadays being increasingly used for the indications where their benefit are less certain. Uh, recently, in a large observational study, uh, they found that nearly two thirds of the patients had no clear indication for the PPI use, and they are being used for the indeterminate durations. Uh, however, guidelines usually recommend them to be used for less than eight weeks, except in some conditions where they can be used for long duration. So we are concerned about the long-term use of PPI because uh, they are linked with a number of the adverse effects uh, which we call PPI associated adverse events and we'll use this term throughout our presentation. The next concern is that it uh, imposes an economic cost and it contributes to the polypharmacy. Similarly, the deprescribing is important strategy because it reduces the pill burden, it reduces the cost and it reduces the adverse events. So these are some of the long, uh, definitive indication for the long-term use of PPIs like Barrett esophagus, uh, severe erosive esophagitis, esophageal structure from GERD, Zollinger Ellison syndrome, esophenic, eosinophilic esophagitis, and for the pre uh, prevention of the idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis and for the gastroprotection in high-risk patients. These are the definitive indications. Where these are some of the conditional indications for the long-term use of PPIs like endoscopy negative reflux disease. Uh, disease which is responsive to PPI and when the symptoms recur on the season of the PPI. These are some of the conditional indications. And there are some conditions where uh, long-term use of the PPIs are not used but they are used uh, improperly or when they uh, are being used. Some of the indications, uh, some of these conditions include using for the non-erosive reflux disease and for the functional dyspepsia where they are actually not indicated so similarly being used for the prevention of the upper GI bleeding from the other from the causes other than peptic ulcer disease and erosive esophagitis. So these are the conditions where long-term PPI is usually not indicated. So these are some of the uh, definitive indication, definite indication for the use of PPI in the less than eight for short-term use. So like a spilory eradication for the stress ulcer prophylaxis in ICU patients, uh, for uninvestigated GRD or dyspepsia, treatment of NSAID related gastric ulcer or duodenal peptic ulcers. So these are some of the definitive, um, definite, definite indication for the short term use of PPIs. These are some of the conditional indications for the short term use, like for uninvestigated dyspepsia, for the prevention of the re bleeding from malaria with tear. And these are the conditions where short term PPIs should not be used, like for the empiric treatment of the lining of pharyngeal symptomatology for acute undifferentiated abdominal pain or for any isolated lower GI symptoms like supravivic pain. So there is no advantage of using PPI in these conditions. So after learning about the indication, let's learn about some of the adverse effects. So on the short term use, PPIs can cause headache, nausea, vomiting, diarrhea, abdominal pain, constipation and flatulence and sometimes acute interstitial nephritis and in the long term use. They increase the risk. They increase the risk of inter, uh, enteric bacterial infection, community acquired pneumonia, and various nutritional deficiencies, fractures, and dementia. So, because of these adverse effects and the because of these adverse effects and the fine uh, cost burden and all other factors, we need to uh, deprescribe the PPIs. And so, what is the guiding principle? So, basically, all the PPIs are considered generally safe. Uh, they should not be used for any med so any medication uh, 
uh, should not be used for the long duration when there is no reasonable expectation of the benefit based on the scientific evidence or prior treatment response. So this is the guiding principle for uh, deprescribing PPI. So this deprescribing is important because it reduces the pill burden, uh, it reduces medication related costs, uh, it reduces the chance of adverse effects related to long term use, uh, it reduces the drug interaction, so uh, it reduces the chance of giving the futile treatment when it's not needed actually. These are three key domains for deprescribing PPI. So we need to document the indication of the PPI, we should always try to find out the patients who are suitable for deprescribing and we should try to optimize the successful deprescribing. So now we'll discuss some of the problems which we faced during uh, while we were trying for deprescribing. So one of them is absence of the continuing indication. Sometimes you may not find the continuing indication for the PPI or because of the lack of documentation we won't know why was PPI started. Similarly sometimes this chronic PPI use might be unintended like uh, PPIs might have been started in the hospital setting and might have been continued during the discharge without review for the indication or ongoing need. Uh, on the other end, patient might have been started uh, for a condition without a definite indication, like for the empiric treatment of the laryngopharyngeal symptoms like cough. Similarly, uh, lack of documentation is also one of the very important factor because when there is uh, no proper documentation of the indication, then it will be very difficult to start deprescribing. And next uh, problem is these PPIs are available over the counter and patient can have easy access to this medicine and they may start this medicine themselves. So that makes uh, it very difficult to deprescribe again. So next thing is uh, around 50% of the PPI users are using higher than standard dose. And these higher than standard dose are not studied in RCTs, they are not approved by FDOs, FDA and they just increase the cost of care and they increase the chance of complication. However, there are some conditions where we can use high dose PPIs like bleeding from peptic ulcer disease or zollinger ellison syndrome. Other than that, usually high dose PPIs are not indicated. So this is again the same, uh, this is the chart which shows the high dose and the low dose PPIs. So the next problem is the risk stratification of the uh, upper uh, GI bleeding, uh, risk of upper GI bleeding. So for this, we, we can use the various um, guidelines and if a patient is on high risk, uh, then we need to continue PPI and if the patient falls on the lower risk, then we need to try to de-escalate the treatment. So next concern is the rebound acid hypersecretion. So when a patient, uh, uh, when a deprescribing is started, then this, uh, because of the hyperplasia of the parietal cells, the acid secretion will increase and this will again cause the upper GI symptoms. So we need to educate the patient about um, these symptoms and uh, we need to anticipate this problem. And this may take around, the resolution of these symptoms may take around eight weeks to six months uh, after the withdrawal of the PPIs. So the solution is we can provide the patients with on-demand PPIs or histamine type receptor antagonist and neutralizing anti uh, uh, or other medications. So the uh, decision regarding the deprescribing should be made by the prescribers uh, who started the PPIs. But uh, this decision should incorporate patient's perspective into uh, decision making. So the next thing is that the deprescribing should uh, be solely based on the lack of the indication for the PPI use, but not on the concerns for the PPI associated adverse effects because there is no strong evidence to suggest that uh, there is increased incidence of any adverse events in the long-term use of PPA, although they are to some extent associated with the long-term complex. So now we'll discuss how to deprescribe uh, PPIs. So we can use various methods to deprescribe PPI. So we can uh, try dose tapering. Uh, in this method, we'll gradually reduce the dose of the PPI and then we stop the PPI and look for the recurrence of the symptoms. And we can also try the abrupt uh, discontinuation. We can just stop the PPI and start a patient on the uh, and monitor the patient for the recurrence of the symptoms and in some cases we can uh, go for the on-demand PPI therapy if the patient develops symptoms after uh, withdrawal of the PPIs. Similarly, we can also try the alternate day low dose PPI if the, uh, and gradually we can stop the PPIs later on. Or in some cases we can uh, directly stop the PPIs and switch the patient to the another group of medicines like um, S2 receptor antagonists. In addition to these uh, methods, we can also advise some non-pharmacological interventions like lifestyle factors, diet, weight, or any stress reduction, 
and head elevation while sleeping so these factors um, these um, interventions can also help in the deprescribing of the ppis so now we'll discuss about the uh, discuss an algorithm to deprescribe the ppi so first of all we need to identify why is patient taking a ppi so we need to find out if there is a history of endoscopy uh, if patient was ever hospitalized for bleeding ulcer or if patient was taking ppi because of the chronic nsaid use or if patient had any heart burn or dyspepsia in the past so if we uh, uh, then if the indication is diff, uh, is like barrett esophagus or if there's chronic NSAID is used, or if there's severe esophagitis, or if there is any indication for the long-term use of the PPI, in those conditions, we should not consider deprescribing PPIs. And if you want to deprescribe, then we should always consult with the gastroenterologist before uh, starting the deprescribing process. But uh, if we are able to find out the indications, like uh, using it for the, if the patient is using it for the peptic ulcer disease, for uh, ICU stress ulcer prophylaxis or for the uncomplicated S. pylori or for other uh, conditions like GRD or for mild to moderate esophagitis then we should uh, always recommend uh, deprescribing after the certain uh, use of the PPI for the certain duration basically usually for the 8 to 12 weeks so if uh, indication is not known in uh, if the indication is not known then in that case also we should try to deprescribe the ppis so so when we start deprescribing we can either stop the ppis directly or we can decrease uh, the dose of ppi to the lower dose or we can stop the ppis and um, ask patient to use the on-demand ppis if their symptoms recur so after starting the process of deprescribing we need to monitor the patient for at least 4 to 12 weeks because uh, this is the time frame where they can uh, develop the symptoms of rebound acid hypersecretion or they can develop the symptoms of the recurrence of the disease so we need to assess and monitor the patients for the 4 to 12 weeks after starting the process of deprescribing so if a patient is able to verbalize we can ask them about the heartburn dyspepsia regurgitation and epigastric pain also we can assess the patient for the loss of appetite weight loss and agitation so um, while monitoring for this recurrence of the symptoms, if there is recurrence of the symptoms, first of all, we should try to uh, use the non-drug approaches, like avoiding the meals uh, two to three hours before bedtime, elevating the head of the bed. And uh, if the symptoms, uh, this recurrent uh, symptoms, uh, if they do not respond to the lifestyle modifications, then we can advise a patient to take the over-the-counter antacids can start patient on the S2 receptor antagonist. We can ask them to use on-demand PPIs, or we can try some uh, alginate as well. So, so even after uh, giving this supportive treatment and um, asking patient to make some lifestyle changes, if the symptoms persist uh, for three to seven days, and if they interfere with the normal activity, then we should always uh, test and treat for the S. pylori infection, and. In some cases, if the symptoms are very severe, causing a lot of a, a problem to the patient, then in those cases, we might need to return back to the previous dose. In summary, so we need to review the indication for the PPI use, and we need to document that indication. If there is no definitive indication, then we should always consider a trial for drip prescribing. And if a patient is taking high dose PPI, then they should be uh, switched to the once the, the ppi and if there is a definite indication for the long-term ppi use then this should not be those type of patients should not be considered for the discontinuation and also if there is a high risk of upper gi bleeding then those patients should not be considered for the deprescribing and uh, all the patients should be educated about the rebound acid hypersecretion and for the deprescribing either dose tapering or abrupt uh, discontinuation can be considered and so our decision to deprescribe the ppi should be based solely on the lack of uh, indication for the ppi to use but not uh, because of the concern for the adverse effects so these are the reference you can go through these articles uh, to study in detail about deprescribing ppi so thank you so much